Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Can we just stand real quick and give Jesus 10 seconds of praise? Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Give someone a high five and sit your butt down. Come on. That pastor just saved butt from the stage. I did. Welcome to Takeover Church. How are you doing? I said, how are you doing? Are you grateful for a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus? Come on. He has saved us from the pits. He has ransomed us from the grips of the devil. He has saved us from eternal separation and damnation and hell. I mean, he is good. Amen. Come on. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, Pastor Matt, I'm the lead pastor of this uh, wonderful band of misfits alongside my amazing wife, Pastor Adrienne. And it's great to have you guys with us for Christmas Eve. It's amazing. I love Christmas. I love Christmas, and I love the praise, and I love the lights, and I love the candles, and I love, I love all of the things that along the way, God has been so gracious with mankind and saying, come labor with me and what I make my bride, my church look like. And so while I love the candles and the lights, and I love the 10-second praise breaks, I'm so grateful for his ability to welcome us in to give him a good and worthy offering, what, what I'm more in love with beyond tradition, beyond pageantry, is the Lord Jesus himself, amen. amen. Here at Takeover Church, as you've probably noticed, we don't do pageantry, we do intimacy. Yeah. We don't do pageantry. I don't want to look like Christians. I want to sit at the feet of the Christ. Yeah. I don't want to play Christianity. I want, to, I want to sit and I want to look into the one who has eyes of fire and I want to become like him. I want to sit at his feet and I want to go from Matt McClure to looking more like whom it is that he desires to be found in the blood of his precious son. Yeah. I appreciate anybody this morning. I know it's been crazy because so far this morning, everything's been a bit more almost sounding like Easter. But if you're aware of the whole purpose and intentionality behind Jesus coming, it wasn't just so that Jesus could stay. That baby in the manger. No, no, no. Listen to me to this morning, friends. In the face of an infant was the countenance of a king. In the face of that infant was the countenance of a king. And he's a king who went first. He's a king that went before us. He's the king that rules and reigns. And he is the king from the manger to the grave to the ascension to the throne of David where he is still ruling and reigning today. Amen. Come on. Praise him. Come on. Now, if it's your first time here, we're buck wild and you're probably already aware of that. This might be the tamest so far that we've ever been. We're about to pop the clutch. I don't enjoy third gear. I want to go fast, baby. I want, to, I want to get after him. Amen? Come on. This morning, if you're new with us, we have been stewarding for 51 weeks now. Somebody say 51. 51, 51 baby. We've been stewarding one prophetic word for our house for the entire year. 51 weeks today. It'll be 52 next Sunday, and I hope to see you here. By the way, can I just rebuke everybody for a second? New Year's Eve and like that whole week, like the last Sunday of the year, is notoriously, statistically, the lowest church attendance in the United States of America. Let that not be said of us that we were too hungover for Jesus. Or we were too getting ready to get hungover for Jesus. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Come on, we're about the real thing, Amen. So for 51 weeks, we have looked at Luke 12, 49 through 50. The Lord has just broken on this obscure portion of Scripture. You see, we live in a time and place, friends, where so many people are sharing silly, I'm going to call it, opinions on whom Jesus is and what Jesus came to accomplish. And one of them right now is like, Jesus is a Palestinian. No, he wasn't. Read your Bible, get off TikTok, please stop. <laughs> That's not an indictment against Palestinian people. That's simply, no, no, no. He is a Jewish man, okay, who had Jewish people, okay? And then when they rejected him, he was like, okay, the insiders want to become outsiders. Well, I'm going to go to the outside. I'm going to make them insiders. Come on, somebody. And now the church has a place in the plan and purpose of family of God. Amen. Amen? That's you and me. That's you and me. 
And so Jesus, he actually laid out his mission statement. It's incredibly clear. He did not mix words. He did not waste words. He didn't say something haphazardly. Everything he said and did ever and everything he still says and doing now has universe creating power within every syllable, within every punctuation, within every pause. Anything that departs from his lips, friends, let me tell you, creates universes. There was once darkness and only darkness and God was there and then he said, let in a second, the L from let left his lips, friends, a light began to be birthed. That's who he is. That's what he does in every single word. And so we celebrate the word of God. If you're new with us, I want you to know one simple thing before we get rolling. We here believe the Bible. Yes. And not only that, listen, we make no apologies for believing the Bible. This church, this house, we celebrate the Bible. We celebrate the word of God. Because friends, in our pursuit, in our over-empathized culture that we are in today, let me tell you a refreshing word. None of us are more kinder, more just than Jesus. Amen? So if God was jealous for his people back then, he is jealous for his people today. And everything he does is to move closer to you, 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 me, 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 and all of them outside. Amen? He longs to be with us. So Luke 12, 49, Jesus, he makes it clear. He goes, listen, I have come to set fire upon the earth. I came to set fire upon the earth. Now, not like we've heard it so many times where, trust me, man, uh, my Pentecostal pop clutch comes out. It's like, yeah, you need to run from the burning and the brimstone, brother. Like y'all know what I'm talking about. We're going to bring fire and brimstone. I get it, okay? I got all the Kenneth Hagin tapes. I'm the man, right? I get it. I'm that dude. We're going to pop the clutch and go crazy Southern Pentecostal all day. However, the greater fire that the Lord longs for and desires for is actually a fire birthed in place and only ran and kept by him. It has nothing to do with hell. Hell is real. Hell is a place. And hell is a place I do not want you to go, which is why I preach the gospel. Amen. I don't want you to live eternally separated from God. In fact, there is a greater burning that the Lord actually offers us than the one that is far away from him. It's his presence, his power, and his person. His presence, his power, and his person. And so he says, listen, I've come to set fire upon the earth, not, not hell, fire, and brimstone. No, no, no. That's a byproduct of you rejecting this fire that I'm offering. Instead of this fire is I want to make myself a kindled people, a kindled body, a kindled bride, people who are so out of love with this world, so out of love with themselves, so out of love of all this world and everything in it has to offer them. And they are so in love with me that I could breathe one word upon them and they would ignite, that they would burn in my glorious light, that they would burn on fire for me. And so we have taken that so strongly and we have set apart so far 51 weeks and said, Lord, rid me of myself. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. So if you're taking notes this morning, the title of my sermon is The Incarnation of Fire. The incarnation of fire. The incarnation of fire. And if you got your B-I-B-L-E's, why don't you wave it at me? Come on, wave a Bible in the air like you just do care. Come on. Yo, it's Christmas Sunday. There's too few Bibles. Okay, who's got an electric Bible? Let's, let's, let's go with the, the light ones. All right, all right, all right. We'll let it work. We'll let it pass. Um, if you need a Bible, there are tons of blue ESVs around the place. Feel free to take one of those. That's free. Uh, and also our amazing killer, Kels in the booth. She will have it up on the Sky Bible back there. All right, Isaiah 9. That's what we're coming out of this morning. Isaiah 9. Come on. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time. He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. How many of you love the Old Testament names? Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. 
for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors. You have broken as on the day of Midian for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, God, Everlasting, Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal and the Lord of hosts, he will do this. Now I really want to finish this rest of this, but I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it when we get into the sermon. So we're going to stick with that portion for now. And then we're going to pray and we're going to see what the Lord will do. Does that sound good? Come on. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that Christmas means. God, I, I live in a time and a place, Father, and you know this, where we have, we have franchised and we have merchandised your son's name. We have taken this beautiful, glorious occasion, God, and, and we've made it about giving everyone else a gift besides you. Father, I pray today we would give you a gift. Lord, no, I know, Lord, I know that you are in gift giving. I know that you love to give good gifts. So there is a place and a purpose for this in this season to love on one another with that material possession. But Father, this morning, I pray right now that before this service is up, God, that we, we would be found giving you a gift, God, giving you a gift, Lord that goes beyond the material God, that goes into our flesh, that goes into our heart, that goes into our mind, that goes from our spirit, that this morning, Lord, you would find individuals and a corporate together church, God, this morning, Lord, that are full of earnest hearts, earnest worship, that this morning, God, we would say, come, Lord Jesus, come. As we celebrate your first coming, Lord, would we live lives worthy of your second coming? So Holy Spirit, we say, nobody came here this morning to hear Pastor Matt's hot takes. We all came here to hear the words of fire that depart from the mouth of God. So Holy Spirit, come. Move in this place. We reject every other spirit. If there's a spirit of depression that comes along with the season, if there's a spirit of loneliness, if there's a spirit of suicide, if there's a spirit of darkness, of depravity, of alcoholism, of drug abuse, of sexual abuse, if there's any spirit in this room besides the Holy Spirit, we send you to hell in Jesus' name so that the Holy Spirit can rule and reign in every person in every place. So right now, Lord, we give this over to you. Come, have your way. And may we today, on this day that represents the birth of our Christ, may we leave here today looking, sounding, acting, and thinking and behaving more like that precious Christ that we've been given. In Jesus' mighty and faithful name, a faith-filled church with their chest, we all said, Amen. Amen. Come on. Who doesn't love Jesus? Oh, the incarnation of fire. The incarnation of fire. The incarnation of fire. A fire. Now, I get a lot of heat around the Christmas season here at church because everyone goes, Pastor Matt, you never preach a Christmas message on Christmas. And I'm proud to say, coming into our sixth year uh, anniversary in, in February, this will be the first time that I do anything remotely close resembling a Christmas sermon. <laughs> You're as close as you may ever get, baby. And it's this, it's this reason. It's not because, it's not because um, I don't think the Christmas story is worthy of being told every year. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with I have decided. I have decided for me in this house that we, we will be a church, we will be a place where the Lord first and foremost dwells. And I gotta tell you, there's not a single solitary Sunday that, or Wednesday or Friday morning that does not pass where the gospel message is not shared where the truth of God and what he has plans for in humanity does not go forth, where his name is not celebrated, where he is not lifted up. Friends, I would dare to say, and I'm not disparaging our brothers and sisters in any other house or any other church, I am simply saying for us in this house, 
we have Christmas every single Sunday. We have Christmas every single Sunday. See, Christmas cannot be for the church one time a year where we finally sit and we look at the incarnate Christ, the one who came, the one who was prophesied, the one who was predetermined, the one that God knew I have to send my word to take on flesh so that we can reset all of this, we can reverse the curse, and I can make a way for my image to be mine again. It can't be just Christmas and Christmas alone, and that's why I've left it up to the Holy Spirit. I've said, Lord, break my heart every week for what you want to do in your people. So a little behind the curtains, I don't sit in a special little office. I do have a nice little office in our home that my wife has allowed me to have, praise God. And uh, <laughs> all the husbands know, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's theirs. And we get part of it. <laughs> but I don't sit in my fancy little office and, and determine, oh, here's my, here's my idea. We're going to do this for six weeks and this for six weeks. I'm going to preach on this and this. and then, No, no, that's not how I work. And God bless my brother and sisters who, who do, but I just, one, I don't see that in Scripture. And two, what I do see in Scripture is, is coming around the Word of God given to us by the Spirit of God and that we need to follow His voice, especially in this day and this hour, more clearer and more closely than ever before. Listen, the time of apathetic Christianity has died. The time for cultural Christianity has come to an end. I would say there was never a time to be apathetic to the cross, and there was never a time to be culturally irrelevant to the cross, and there's never been a time to be casual with the cross. But we have been, and it has come, and God has ended it, and I'm telling you right now, He has a plan for Christmas to be the Spirit in the church every time we gather. Because there's an incarnation of this fire that we've been preaching about for 51 weeks. And it came. It came in the form of this baby in a manger. The infant face. The countenance of a king. The lamb. The lion. All that he is. His fullness thereof. What was his footstool, the earth, he decided to put on flesh and dwell among us. You see, the reason we're talking about the Old Testament today is one, because this is one of the most clearest prophecies that the world, not just the, not just the church, not just Israel, this is world history, friends. If you look at the world today, you would know we base history off what? Historical documents, things that we can prove happen. And guess what we can prove happen? Everything in that written word of God. I don't care if you got to go back six pages on Google to find that to be true. Friends, we will never, we will never reinvent the gospel for our culture. We will never reinvent the gospel for the world that we live in. Because his word is true today, yesterday, and forevermore. And so what happens is that from the beginning, friends, we got to understand this. We live in a time and a place where we want to detach the church at large right now. There is conversation taking place about detaching ourselves from the Old Testament. Friends, you got to understand, the Old Testament is full of the promises of God for the people of God. See, see, we sit here and we go, oh, it's not relevant because we're underneath a new covenant and Jesus has fulfilled the old law. Yes, Jesus has fulfilled the old law. He is the fulfillment of the covenant. He is the reason for the season. He's a reason for it all. But you got to understand, it's out of him fulfilling the law, something you and I could never do, that actually enables us to walk in the promises of the old covenant. See, we miss this. We miss this. We want to detach because we're like, he fulfilled it all so I can just run around like a wild man. No, you cannot. You can be a wild man for Jesus. You cannot be a wild man for Matt. You cannot be a wild man for Jay. You cannot be a wild woman for Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Good to see you. You cannot be. No, 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 no. This whole thing, this whole thing, it came about ending you and me and letting him begin a new life in us. I appreciate anybody this morning. You see, there's this thing in the Old Testament where you and I, right in the beginning, we had it all. Human beings, we had it all. Here's the deal. So many of us will sit in our seats and we start talking about Adam and Eve. And as Christians, we go, I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with that. Like, I should be let off scot-free. Incorrect. 
If we want the promises that Adam and Eve walked in, we have to take responsibility for the failure that they walked in. Wonder why? Because you and I, we lie and we hide from God every single day. We are in desperate need of the blood of Jesus just as much as they were and just as much as we will be until he returns. And so we look at this, and the reason I call it the incarnation of fire is because we can look at a timetable, we can look at history, and we can see from the beginning there had to be this moment in time where God, he goes, listen, I have created you, man and woman. Yes, friends, there are only two genders, and you probably won't hear that in another church in our area today. So God bless you, we affirm the Bible. Anyways. In the land of confusion, let truth break forth. Amen? In the land of confusion. Here. But here's the deal. (laughs) He created the man and woman. He created them in his image and likeness. Now, if you're a parent in here today, guess what? I guarantee you can understand. You desire deeply to have a relationship with your image bearer. You desire greatly to have a relationship. Not just an acquaintanceship. I don't know if that's a word not just strangers in a home, not just somebody that you kind of know or they grew up and they flew the coop and like all those things, but no, you desire to have some level of intimacy with your image bearer. They look like you, they are like you, they come from you, and you have a desire to pursue a relationship with them. And then if you're a son or a daughter in here, guess what? You and I, we too, we have been placed and endowed with, Paul puts it this way, every man and every woman has had eternity placed in their heart. What does that mean? That means you and I, we, we outside of Christ and in Christ, we too, we will wrestle in this life, in this flesh, and we will, we will count and we will look at our lives. And so often we're sitting here, people think about eternity. They think about after death. They think about what is this life all about. The single number one most Googled question in the world is, why am I here? It actually is, which is insane. I've never Googled that. Generally, it's words that my wife say that I want to make sure are real words. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I love you, baby. Just joking. It's me. That's the problem, not her. <laughs> She's educated. I'm educated. You know what I mean? Like, it's different, but it's not. But this is the reality. We wrestle with this all the time. We think about why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? How am I going to live? Is this really all that there is to life? Humans, we wrestle with this day in and day out. And so many of us, we live from sex to drink to drugs to a paycheck that's not worth all the hours that we spend at the place that we're at, right? And then we rinse, wash, repeat. And that is what the human condition outside of Jesus will pursue. Pleasure and numbness from pain. Money to sustain a life that you're not really proud of. Is this too real for Christmas? I thought we were here to talk about the Savior of the world. How do we talk about the Savior without talking about the things he has saved us from? Amen. Because in every son and every daughter, eternity has been placed in the heart of man. And so you and I, we, if you're outside of the will of God, you are doomed to consider these thoughts and wrestle with these thoughts 24-7, 365, 364 on leap year. For the rest of us, we're not doomed, we're called. They're doomed and condemned to wrestle with those thoughts. For you and I, we are actually called, consecrated, and invited into consider these questions. Why? Because we know where we're going, because we know who has paid for us, and we know how we're supposed to live, and we know what he's made available in this life and the next. I appreciate anybody this morning. This is the point. This is the point of Christmas. There is a father who longs to have a relationship with the one who bears his image. And there should be sons and daughters who long to have a relationship with the one whom gave them that image. He has imprinted on us something in him, something from him, something about him, that we will live our entire lives trying to seek and find in every other fireplace. Every other thing that can keep us warm, every other thing that can keep us feeling intimate, the every other thing that will ultimately leave us feeling shallow 
empty, starved. Friends, this is, this is the good news. Because you were made in his image and likeness and there is something in our father who is always and consistently without failure pursuing and calling you and I home. This is the good news. This is the good news. You see, he, from before you and I ever sinned, he rigged the game <laughs> because he made the game. He made life. He thought it, he spoke it, he birthed it, he created it, and he had a failsafe in mind for those who would come home to him. He decided, listen, when you get around me, things break. They either break into me or they break upon me. And when you come to me, you are going to have a moment. Every single human being, I believe this emphatically with all that I am, every single person has considered whether we have gotten the gospel to all the nations yet or all the tribes yet is up for debate. We will continue to do that until Lord Jesus comes home. Amen? Amen. Come on, we love missions. It's good. But let me tell you, every human being on this planet has considered the thought, who is this God? Who is God? And if there's a God, and if there's a God, why does he allow these things to happen? If there's a God, why does this take place? If there's a God, why is there so much chaos and calamity? If there's a God, and every human being will come to these questions because eternity has been placed in their heart. And God said, listen, you can get so broken that you don't want me, and that breaks my heart, and unfortunately there is a place for that. There's a lake of fire for that. I do not want that for you. And so he will pursue you in salvation all the days of your life. And part of how he does that, friends, is he had a master key and a master plan for this lock of chains that you and I walk around in. And he called it eternity in the heart of man. He placed eternity in the heart of man. See, when we have eternity in the heart of man, but we're living in sin. One of the ways that eternity in the heart of man gets corrupted is that we, we don't look for the incarnation of fire. Instead, we start to look for the imitation of fire. I said, we don't look for the incarnation of fire. We start to look for the imitation of fire. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? And that's why we get around these seasons. You see, we've duped the whole world. We've gotten them all to celebrate our Christ. <laughs> they think they took Christmas from us. No, 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 we have kept Christmas for him. And whether you know it or not, and whether you want to search it or not, you at some point, in some way, in some portion, are taking place in celebrating our coming king. But why do you think around these times that are supposed to be about intimacy with loved ones, intimacy with the Father, intimacy with Jesus, intimacy with the Spirit, intimacy with our church, why do you think so many, both in the church and outside the church, we struggle with loneliness? We struggle with suicidal thoughts. We struggle with attempting to find an imitation for this fire that we know has been placed on the inside of us it's because sin has come. We have sinned. And, and when we are broken and the, and the Lord Jesus has not had a chance to pour his blood out upon us, fill us with his spirit, creating us a new creation when he has not had the opportunity to do that friends we we will live trying to seek and find this imitation of fire everywhere else but him can i tell you as a christian today if you're a christian in the place and you still struggle with loneliness in the holiday season can I tell you your loneliness that you may be feeling, it may be jaded and corrupted and corroded by the sin in your life? I want to tell you this. This is a stiff word from a pastor who loves you more than if he sees you again. If you get that sin out, if you fast, you pray, when that loneliness comes, that loneliness, once that sin is out, that loneliness becomes an invitation to meet with him. Jesus, the perfect one who lived a perfect life, who died a perfect death, who rose a perfect resurrection, who ascended in perfection and who gave us that same spirit that enabled him to do that, that now lives in us, he never lived a lonely day in his life. 
Why? Because he had perfect intimacy with the Father. How did he have perfect intimacy with the Father? He was holy. How was he holy? He had no sin. And I am telling you, around this holiday season, you'll start to think about alcohol. You'll start to think about women. You'll start to think about guys. You'll start thinking about cuffing season. Somebody just said that to me the other day. It's cuffing season. I'm feeling alone. Oh, you mean you're in chains? Doesn't sound like getting intimate with somebody else will actually break those chains. It sounds like you'll be further cuffed. Sounds like there's one who is intimate that when you're intimate with him, he actually breaks every chain. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? I thought that was the single most ridiculous word that I have ever heard. It's cuffing season. And then I realized the devil's been pulling tricks. The devil's been pulling tricks. It's cuffing season? No, it's consecration season. It's time to be set apart for him and with him. It's time to be set apart for him and with him. I'm telling you, friends, when you begin to get that sin now, watch. Watch, all of a sudden there's the absence of pornography and there's the pursuit of holiness. All of a sudden there's the absence of alcohol in your home, so it's a lot harder for you to go to. And then there is the presence of pursuing him. All of a sudden you begin to do this and you're like, you know what? I actually don't need to have a boo thing this holiday season. Instead, what am I doing? I found at church. I'm found in community. I'm at prayer meetings. I am giving up in the natural to grow up in the spiritual. And I have decided... That the one who cures every ailment, including loneliness and suicidal thoughts and tendencies and depression. He's going to be my comforter. He's going to be my intimacy. If I'm going to be cuffed to anyone, let it be to Jesus. If I'm going to be cuffed to anyone, let it be to Jesus. You see, it it wouldn't be right for you to come to church on a Christmas and to not have you be preached to. You see, Paul says, how will they believe if no one preaches? How will they believe if no one preaches? You see, friends, there is a greater life. I am so aware this morning that some of us are saved and on our way to heaven and living lives with Jesus here and now, which is a priority, by the way. Here and now life with him, not thereafter with him here and now could you imagine having the label of christian all the days of your life but never experiencing the fruit of what it means to be a christian all the days of your life and then having the best part of jesus be when you didn't need him in anything instead all you had was him could you imagine that all you did was live for the day one day when you would be in heaven but you lived like hell the entire time you were here am i preaching to anybody this morning Come on, I, I, I've sat through too many Christmas services. I've done too many myself where we have sugarcoated and we have done these things. And I'm telling you, I'm aware that there are people in this room today who have not heard the good news of this Christ. And this is the good news. He's better. He is better and he is greater. He is better and he is greater. He is better and he is greater. This incarnate fire that we get to have relationship with This burning baby, man, God, King, Lord, and Savior, Lion and Lamb, this man from Galilee with scars in his hand and his feet and his head and his side and his back. This Jesus, he is better drink. He is better bread. He is better way. He is a better life. He is a better high. He's better. And he's better intimacy than the things that you and I tried to do to fill that eternal hole on the inside of us. You see, Isaiah the prophet, he knew this. The reason we're doing this is because Isaiah, he prophesied the very thing that the angels and Mary would end up speaking about and talking about in the moment that he comes. And the wild thing is, friends, The amount of years that these are separated, the amount of years in between them, and the amount of calamity and the amount of sin that Israel still continued to make even after receiving this prophetic word is kind of mind-blowing. And if you're a pastor, you're freaking frustrated by it. You're like, come on, it's Jesus. Get with the program, you know. He's worth it. He's worth it. So Isaiah, he's tasked with prophesying and preaching to God's chosen people. 
And he's saying to them, listen, anguish is going to cease for her that believes. All anguish is going to cease. All pain, all hurt, it's all going to cease. The interesting thing is, though, his end game for pain and anguish actually isn't heaven. Are you hearing me? His end game for pain and anguish is this glorious light. But this glorious light isn't actually the arrival in heaven. As you read this moment, it's not the end of your life that will be the ending of all pain and anguish. It's in the midst of your life, given every reason to experience pain and anguish, that there is a wonderful, merciful counselor, and his name is Jesus. Pastor, are you saying I can live a pain-free life? I'm not saying that there won't be trial. I'm not saying that there won't be tribulation. I'm not saying there won't be testing from the Lord himself. And I'm not saying that you and I won't run over our own tail, being silly and sinful, in the midst of our sanctification process with him, where we create, unfortunately, ramifications and consequences for our actions. But what I am saying is that in the midst of pain, pain doesn't get the final word. In the midst of anguish, anguish doesn't get to be the defining factor. In the midst of all of these very real realities that we will experience this side of heaven in the earth because of our sin and pain and the sin of others, we have this wonderful, merciful counselor. You see, he was trying to get a point to Israel, the same point he's been trying to get around to humanity since he birthed us and we failed him. I'm better. I'm better. He says, listen, listen, there's going to be a marvelous light that is shown to those in pain and in anguish, those that keep committing adultery on me, those that I've made covenant with, and yet every single time I speak to them or I see them or I go looking after them, I see them worshiping somebody else they shouldn't be. I see them getting up to things I have said that is not best for your life. I see them living in ways that are not my ways. I see them being unholy while I am holy in the only way we can have relationship as if you too are holy. And so Isaiah, he's prophesying, he's listening, listen, he ends it, he ends this whole portion with going, here's Jesus, we'll get to that part in a second, but he ends it, it's important that we know this, with all the things that we continue to do. But friends, when you look at that, he's not laboring the point, He's not beating them over the head going, you're just going to continue. No, no, no. He's saying this is, in fact, the human condition. Because you can look at what he says on the sinful end of the scripture, and you can look at it, and if you're sober in here, you'll look at it and go, I do these things. I may not have been in war, but I've betrayed. I've lied. I've committed deceit. I've stole. I've had adulterous thoughts. All of a sudden, you start to look at this soberly, and you're like, I have participated in these things. I have participated in these things. But Isaiah's saying to those people who have participated in those things, who have lived those lives, he is saying, listen, there's one coming that's better. That's better. It's actually worth following our God now before this one comes because he's worthy. He says to those in pain and anguish, you have been shown a great light. What is that great light? You are a light unto my path. You illuminate every step. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Listen. He is the light of the world. And he says, for those who have lived in a nation in a land of darkness. Friends, it's dark right now, are you aware? Yeah. It's dark right now. Do you know what I love so much about church? And not just take over church, but the church, but specifically take over church, kind of impartial there. Is that I know no matter how, I, that I know no matter how dark it is outside that door and that door. A great and marvelous light is shined in here. A great and marvelous light is shined in here. And it's a place where you can come and we can pray and we can see healing. It's a place that you can come and we can pray and we can give prophetic words that will illuminate your step. If you need direction, I don't know why you're not a part of a church. 
If you need vision for your life, I don't know why you're not a part of the church. If you need reconciliation in your marriage, I don't know why you're not a part of the church. If you need counseling, I don't know why you're not a part of the church. If you need edification to be built up, I don't know why you're not a part of the church. If you have sin in your life and you want to rid yourself of it, I don't know why you're not a part of the church because I am telling you, it is dark out there, but there is a light in here. Because we have this incarnation of fire. We have this baby, this Jesus, that when God saw no other way, didn't matter how much we sacrificed on the altar. Doesn't matter how well we raised and fattened our calves. Doesn't matter how well we farmed and built a harvest. Doesn't matter how much we accrued for ourselves in a monetary fashion, how much money we had in our bank account, and how much seed we have to bring to the church as an offering. It didn't matter how much you and I achieved in this life. He couldn't have relationship with us because our track record shows that outside of checkmate, we will continue to do the things we've always done. But praise God. But praise God. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Praise God. Amen. Praise God that he had the game rigged. He had Jesus in mind. John tells us that in the beginning was God and the spirit of God dwelt among the earth and the word of God was God and was with God and the word of God left God and put on flesh and dwelt among us. This, this man, this God, this word, this Jesus of ours. Friends, he came. And he was raised with people who were in a messy situation. They were virgins and there was words that were being flown around and they're not married, but Mary's going to have a baby and all these things. And obviously you got Herod at the time and you got all these things that are taking place in pursuit. The world has all try to kill babies and the world continues to try and kill babies and there's a moment in Jesus' birth story where again they're trying to kill babies because sin hates life Jesus says I am life and life to the full sin hates life the demonic hates life wants to end God's image bearers in the earth is pastor preaching on abortion at Christmas? You're dang right I am. Because I don't know if I'll see you again. I don't know if I'll see you again. But I know that his plan has always been to create for himself a burning people and that includes the babies that we have discarded. Yes. Pastor Matt, it's uncomfortable. It's supposed to be Christmas. This is the good news. Yeah. This is the good news. The good news is that, man, we have done these terrible, sinful acts as humankind, as mankind, and yet there is a wonderful, merciful counselor, everlasting God, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Can I ask you a query this morning? Can I pose to you a question? If Jesus is the head, and Christians don't want to involve themselves in politics, how will the government ever be upon his shoulders? We will have the world that we minister to or we don't minister to. The world and those outside of the church, they will experience the world that we either minister to or we don't minister to. Christians should stay out of politics. No, politics in this nation should be the very first place. That should be our pursuit. So many Christians, they want to get famous for Jesus, to make Jesus famous, and that corrupts them. What we need is lowly, contrite, in heart, humble people who love more than anything, sitting at the feet of Jesus and weeping more than they love passing a bill or getting paid off. And we need those people at the feet of Jesus to be found in the halls of justice. Am I preaching to anybody? Can I just tell you, God's ways are best whether we believe in him or not. That's Christmas.
That's the point. We have a wonderful, merciful counselor, Jesus. And so while we try to find counseling in all these other places, we have the perfect counselor here. While we try to find wonder in all of these other things, Hollywood, fame, success, everything else, while we try to find awestruck wonder, he is the most awe-striking, wondrous one. I appreciate anybody this morning. He is saying, listen, if you look at the scripture verse, everything in here, he is better than all the things we proceed and we go after. Worship team, you can make your way up here. Friends, this is, this is the point of Christmas. This is the point of Christmas. Is that there would be this one who could come into the midst of our most dirt, the most grime, the most pain, the most anguish, that in the midst of the hardest things that we've experienced, the things that have happened to us, the sin that has taken place against us, and the sin that we've committed against ourselves and others, in the midst of all of that death, there was one that could not be defeated by death, by sin, or by hell, and all the demons that come along with it. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So I don't know where you're at this Christmas. I don't know what life has looked like for you. I don't know whether you've been wayward with Jesus or you've been faithful with Jesus. I don't know if you've been inconsistent with Jesus or you've never even met this man. But this morning for the rest of our time together, this is going to be the pursuit. You see, for 51 weeks, I have, I have done my utmost to sit at the feet of the Lord and hear from his lips, his heart, for every person that fills a chair in this room every single week. That there was things every week that he was chipping away at like a great carpenter, like a great sculptor, that he was chiseling away and chipping away at to build for himself an edifice, a masterpiece. Something beautiful and something burning. And every single week, in every single message, in every single sermon, there was something in there to break a little off you, and a little off me, and a little off her, and a little off him, and a little off the person that only came that one time, and they were like, these people are too for real. But what was placed on the inside of them was a longing for more of him. I felt like the Lord told me every person that will ever leave Takeover Church will have three responses. One. They'll get out there amongst the waves and realize there's a real thing with a real Jesus who's being preached here and they need him, they'll come back. Two, they'll go some other place and once they've heard the truth, they'll never be satiated. They'll stay there disgruntled and they'll be a problem for the pastors at that other house. That sucks. Or three, they would have heard the truth and they would be so upset by it on the inside, maybe not even be able to cognitively put thought to it, but they are disgruntled on the inside because they've heard the truth and they will actually end up leaving the church altogether. But it's not because Takeover Church possesses something different than everybody else. It's not because Takeover Church has the one thing, the answer to the universe. It's because we have made that thing that so many of us possess, we've made that the prize. See, for far too long, friends, would you stand? See, far too long, friends. The world has been disinterested in church because the church has been disinterested in Jesus. The world has been unsatisfied with church because the church has been unsatisfied with Jesus. But can I tell you, when we look at this moment, that before his blood was ever shed, before the sacrifice was ever made, before the spirit was ever poured out, in this moment, heaven was clearly satisfied with Jesus. And if heaven is satisfied with Jesus, will the church be satisfied with Jesus? Will you? be satisfied with Jesus see everything we do we're gonna we're ultimately gonna try to add to him and he's gonna keep trying to block it off and knock it off and he's gonna be merciful with us and he's gonna continue to show us just how wonderful he is he's just gonna say yeah yeah I know you want to do that other thing but now's the time for that thing look at my eyes again yeah, I know you want to go here and do this, but listen, this is not what I have for you in this season. That's a great idea. Let it become a God idea. Look at my eyes again. 
I know the marriage was failing six ways from Sunday. I understand that. I understand you've made all the mistakes. I was there every moment, and I was actually preaching to you in your heart, saying, don't go there. You want your marriage to be fixed? Look at my eyes again. Look at my eyes again. Well, I keep going back to alcohol and pornography and all of these invitations. Look at my eyes again. I am the one with eyes of fire. Come and behold me. Come and behold me. Everything that's wrong in you can be ripped out of you, cleaned off for you, and cleansed from you. But look at my eyes again. You see, friends, I, I want to put something. While we celebrate a baby in a manger, can we put something in a casket today? While we celebrate the birth of our Savior in a manger, can we put something in a casket today? You see, we're in West Michigan. And for all the churches we have, there are so many Christians with really poor theology. And what you believe will always determine how you behave. I don't care how you want to live it and how you want to call it. What you believe will always determine how you behave. See, when Jesus came, he didn't just clean sin off you. The blood of Jesus isn't spiritual Windex that just cleans your muck and mire off of you real well. No, no, no. Every time we read about the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, and the plan of Jesus, we don't see the word clean, we see the word cleansed. We see the word cleansed. And so I understand the poor interpretation of the NIV when it says the word clean, but the truth of the root of the word is a cleansing. It is this inside work from the inside out that takes all that is broken in you that causes you to get the muck and get the mire. No, no, no. He doesn't just clean your outside. He cleanses you from the inside out. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. This is what this baby in this manger, that is what Christmas is all about. This is what this wonderful, merciful counselor is about. This is what Isaiah was prophesying to those who would rather build idols and commit adultery than pursue this living God. He is saying to you and to me and for all of human history, even you cleaning yourself up for me isn't enough for what I want to do in and through you. So this morning, I want to invite you into the cleansing. You see, friends, we're, we're not always the most raise your hand wherever you are, commit Jesus to your life, church. Why is that? Because I want to see the Holy Spirit begin to work on the inside of you. But what I'm going to do in this moment is this. We can kill the lights because it's going to get a little intimate. But I'm not going to ask you to bow your head, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Instead, I'm going to invite you into a moment where your life can forever change. And I'm not just, again, I'm not just talking about your eternity. This isn't an eternal problem. This is, this is a temporal problem today. I want to invite you into this moment where your life here and now can radically change. If your life changes here and now, your eternity will be taken care of. This is a moment about how you live with Jesus in the midst of the world giving you every reason not to live with Jesus. In the midst of all the pain that would convince you he's not a good God, I'm here to tell you he's a great God. He's not a good God, he's a great God. He's a better God. And he's better than we fed you. He's better than we've preached. He's better than we know him to be. And I am committed to you and I'm committed to him of taking us into that better and that greater. So right now, we're gonna come and sing. We're gonna sing, come and behold him this Christmas. We're gonna make this a moment where it's not about reindeer and it's not about gifts and it's not about traditions. It's about beholding the lamb. Yes, but I gotta ask right where you are, everyone's heads up, everyone's looking around because this is a family. And if you wanna join the family, I'm not even saying take over church. I'm saying the kingdom of God. If you wanna be sons and daughters coming home, answering the ache in your heart for eternity, if that's you, and you wanna meet this Jesus here and now. With every eye open, with everyone looking around and no heads bowed, if you wanna meet this Jesus that I have just talked about, would you raise your hand right where you are? See that hand, I see that hand. Is there more hands? Come on, I see that hand. Come on, come on. Then here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray 
a prayer over you. The altar is opened up. We believe in that here because I'm going to tell you this. You just took a bold step. You proclaimed before a pastor. You, took, you proclaimed before a pastor and Christians. You want to live for Jesus. Here's the next bold step. Come and sit at the altar and proclaim before our Jesus that you want to live for Him. And I'm telling you, when we do something in the natural, as a response to the spiritual, we unlock it on the inside of us and we solidify this change. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, don't wait for me to be done. Come now. This is your moment with Jesus. Come now to the altar. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for the fire of God, your presence, your person, your power, God. I thank you, Lord that you decided long ago that no matter how far we went, no matter how dumb we got, no matter how hard we made things for you, God, we broke your heart. You made a way. You placed God in our heart even before we broke yours. The longing and the pursuit of you. So Father, right now I pray, as every heart begins to ponder, as every heart begins to confess, as every heart begins to take prize of Jesus, and we say, I want to behold you. I want to quit beholding the things that I've always beheld and I've always held on to. And I want to look to you. I want to look at you. I want to fall in love with your eyes. I want to fall in love with your hair. I want to fall in love with your nail pierced hands. I want to fall in love with the thorn scars on your head. I want to fall in love with Jesus. So love of God, come. Love of God, come. Love of God, come. Rapture us in your love right now. Wrap us up in your love right now. God, if there's going to be any unwrapping this weekend, may you unwrap our hearts right now, God. If there's going to be any unraveling of bows, may there be an unraveling of chains in this house right here and right now, God. Father, if there's a gift we could give you, let it be our lives right here and right now, God. Fully, completely, entirely, and rightly unto the risen one. So we're going to sing. And all God's people are going to go after him with reckless abandonment. With loving pursuit. Right now, in Jesus' mighty name. We give you our lives, not just our hearts, God. We're too sophisticated. We're too crafty. We've been in sin for far too long, God. If we don't give you our lives, we will try to keep you as simply the owner of our hearts, but not of our eyes and not of our ears, not of our tastes, not of our minds. So right now, Lord, we say, we don't want to cheat on you, God. We don't want to cheat on you, God. We want to love you not just in heart and not just in theory. We want to love you with our lives. So help us, Lord, to see you rightly in this moment. Come and behold, church, in Jesus' mighty name. Let us sing. Let us worship. Let us repent. Let us pray. Let us come home in Jesus' name. Amen.